Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. My new book, Diary of a Psychosis, is out. It's the most lively, devastating baseball bat to the throat takedown of what the public health establishment did in 2020 and beyond that you can imagine. It's my first book in nine years, and you're going to love it. Check it out at diaryofcovid.com. And if you've already bought it, make sure also to visit diaryofcovid.com so you can claim your free bonuses, including my free companion volume, Collateral Damage, a collection of stories from real people who suffered under the restrictions. They weren't allowed to tell their stories at the time, but every one of them told me, we just want to be heard. Check it all out at diaryofcovid.com. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 2453, with our old friend, Dr. Mary Ruwert, who is a research scientist, ethicist, and a libertarian author and activist. She's been around a long time in this movement. She is a kind of elder statesman, I would say. And I hear so many people tell me that her book, um, Healing Our World, managed to reach their, let's say, bleeding hard or progressive style friend, that it spoke a language that they could actually, um, that resonated with them and didn't seem like it was condescending or nasty or making fun of them, but simply describing our ideas in a way that they could latch on to. And that's, that's no small accomplishment. And so today I want to talk a little bit about what Mary's up to now because it's it's all very interesting stuff. So, Mary, first of all, welcome back to the show. And how would you update that that bio I just gave? Well, I would say that you've got it pretty well down. I've been in the Libertarian Party long enough to have been on the Libertarian National Committee several terms. I've been on the Judicial Committee. I've actually chaired that. And, of course, because of my science background, I had a lot to say about covid <laughs> um, I've also been um, active in um, Kill Country Cats, which is um, a group that tries to trap, neuter, and release feral kitties so that we have staple colonies rather than starving kitties outside. As you probably know, a lot of people dump cats and dogs, especially from the COVID pandemic, where they took these animals in and enjoyed their companionship, and then when they went back to work, decided they didn't need them anymore, so they'd been dumping them. And, you know, that's kind of my evocation. I try to work with animals and help them out if I can. Oh, okay. So I didn't know about that particular mm -hmm. part of your, of, of your work. Well, so one thing, interesting thing that's happened uh, of the many since the last time you and I talked was that I'm pretty sure I recall um, gosh, now for some reason I'm blanking on his name. What is the Klaus Schwab? That's right. The, the oh, guy yes. from the, yes. the World Economic Forum. And the thing, the guy, it's not enough that the way he talks is like a villain, but you look at pictures of him and half the time he dresses like a villain. It's like he's not even trying to conceal it in any way. But, but he had something to say about libertarians. Yes. Yes, he did. He gave us the best advertisement we could get. He said that we were stopping him from, I guess, um, <laughs> I guess I would say, actually constructing his vision of the World Economic Forum dominating the world. I don't think we could get a better advertisement than that. <laughs> yeah, because it, it seems like every time I see a 30-second clip that somebody's taken of some WEF event, it's some crazy person saying some wildly insane thing. And, and it's like each one's trying to one-up the other. And, you know, in the old days, you used to think, well, I know that there are crazy academics out there or the odd government official out there who have wild ideas, but I know those are never actually going to be implemented. I, I remember in college, I would say, oh, I got all these crazy professors in the law schools and stuff like that, but this will never get beyond the gates of the university. But now we're living at a time when it seems to have crept out of there. Yes. Yes, it's actually very scary. I would not have predicted that most people would pick up on this and somehow think it's right. But I think maybe a lot of people echo it because they're afraid of being out of step, which, 
with what they consider consensus. And I think that's changing because in spite of the censorship that's been going on during COVID, the truth is, has a way of getting out. And I think people are reconsidering. In fact, I've heard uh, Gloss uh, talk about how um, disappointed he is and how shocked he is that people would think he had bad motivations, um, that somehow dominating the world was a bad thing, you know, because I, he portrays himself as helping, as does Bill Gates. And maybe they really feel that they're helping. But I don't think the average person sees that when they lose their job because they don't want to take a vaccine. They feel they should have choice. And one thing that we didn't discuss, Tom, and I should have mentioned when you were talking about my bio, is for the last, oh, I'd say 15 years, I've either chaired or been on an IRB, which, as you know, um, is an institutional review board. And any human research in the United States and some other countries, too, that have to, um, they have to go before our board basically, and submit their protocol. And usually a 25 to 30-page um, informed consent document, which human subjects have to get and understand and sign before they take an experimental treatment. And as you know, for a long time, the COVID vaccine was an experimental treatment and nobody got that informed consent. And that is a real tragedy because we established this process because of what happened at the Nuremberg trials, that really the thought was, let's try to have some oversight so that this never happened again. But in fact, the government has always been the primary violation of things like informed consent. And we saw that happened when, you know, we had the COVID crisis. You know, there are a couple of things occur to me. I, I wrote in my email newsletter last week um, about actually, it turns out, a small clip I had seen from the WEF. And it was a, believe it or not, it was a Professor Woods, no relation, from yeah. Oxford University. And she was saying that it's an interesting moment in history because the elites get along with each other better than ever and they're better connected to each other than ever. But the problem now is that the people are, t are suspicious of them more than ever. So the elites are connected better than ever, but they're also held in more contempt than ever. And if the people don't follow us, she says, then we're not going to be able to accomplish what we want. And I just love that, that frank use of the word we, what, what we want. She doesn't mean we, the people. She means we, them. Yes, yes. And, and that's the power of the people, really, because... There's more of us <laughs> than there are of them. So if we, if we protest, if we say no, if we go out and lobby or, you know, have gatherings uh, in front of the Capitol or in front of the Brussels place where these guys meet in Davos, then we have a chance to turn it around. They can't uh, do it without us. Or our consent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like, if, if we wanted to stop it, it could be stopped. So, uh, and, and another thing that, that occurred to me not long ago that I want to run by you, and then I want to talk about um, an interesting project you have going, is that okay. in, in the 21st century, there have been three episodes, more, more than any other episodes, where I've heard people say, well, at a moment like this, nobody can be a libertarian, like the, or this is a terrible time to be a libertarian. So COVID was one, can't be a libertarian during a pandemic, Mary. Uh, second the 2008 financial crisis. You remember George W. Bush, I have to abandon free market principles to save the free market system. We heard him say that. And then the third was 9-11. Well, you can't be a libertarian on 9-11 because you see, if you're a libertarian, this sort of thing happens and we have to go, uh, you know, kick some asses out there, all that. And yet, once the, the dust settled and our wits returned, you realize that actually... If you'd been a libertarian in all three cases, things would have turned out much better in yes, each case. Yes. Well, this time goes back to what happened to when the U.S. started shifting from a very free country. Uh, and I realized there were exceptions to this. So like, you know, 
it wasn't universal. There were some classes such as, you know, maybe women and, and people of color that didn't have total freedom. But in the early 1900s, something changed in the way we, we regarded freedom. So the elites started saying things like, well, you know, you freedom is a great thing, but you know, it really doesn't help the poor. It really doesn't keep the environment clean. And, and so what they did is they made the argument that liberty wasn't practical, and people bought into that. And of course, liberty, as you just gave the best example for, is exactly what is most practical. So it's, I think we may be coming back to that, because now we're seeing an extreme, as we did in all the three areas that you mentioned, we saw how bad things got when we gave up our liberty to make things better. It didn't make things better, it made them worse. So let's talk now about, um, so one, of, one of the things you're, you're good at is, uh, and, and I think this comes through in your book, by the way, which, which I'll link to, is it still easy to get? Yes, Healing Our World, I think is what you're referring to. And yes. actually, in the project we're going to talk about in a little bit, people can find out how they can get a digital copy free. <laughs> Oh, well, that's even better. That's even better. Because yeah, I thought you might like that. <laughs> what, what, we, what we need uh, is, um, uh, is are, are people who are able to give pithy, yes, but, but substantive pithy answers to the kinds of objections people might have. Now, there, there are plenty of people with good faith objections. It's not that everybody is just trying to trip us up or they just, they're just not curious. It's understandable that if nobody's ever presented these ideas to you before, and if you're just relying on the knowledge you got from the authorities in your life, then you're going to be skeptical of what we have to say. But there sure. are some people, uh, myself included, uh, who have genuine um, questions out of a, an authentic curiosity. And, and the thing is that with libertarianism, we have to be prepared for like anything somebody could ask us. Uh, you know, if you're, let's say you're a Republican, like a middle of the road Republican, and somebody says to you, uh, well, how would education work under your system? They'd say, they'd say, well, you know, we'll have some government run schools and then maybe we'll have some vouchers here and there. They've got some kind of standard boilerplate answer. But with us, it would have to be, well, let's see, you, you basically want to overthrow everything. So what would you do? And so we have to have, or what would you do with health care? Or a Republican could say, well, yes. we'll have health savings accounts and we'll have this, that, and the other subsidy. And, you know, that's a lot easier to say, and that goes down easier for people because it sounds more familiar. If we just say, oh, yeah, we're just going to get the government completely out of healthcare, that just seems crazy to people. They want more information. And, and right. not every libertarian is going to be prepared, you know, with 10 single space pages worth of, of, of details and data to answer all these types of questions. So one of your strengths is that you're good at that. You know, somebody asks a question, well, I, I don't see how this would work. And you're very good at giving those pithy responses. And by the way, another part of this is pointing out to people that very often they're comparing not the real world with libertarianism. They're comparing a utopia with libertarianism. Yeah. And we have to say, yeah. you know, the schools right now, like in this day and age, are terrible and everybody knows yeah. it. But for yes. some reason, when you ask me about education, we're acting like it's great now and everybody in the inner city is getting a fantastic education, but if you came along, it would be worse. I don't see how. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, and of course, people have lost track of what freedom means. When I went into the classroom in the 80s I, and early 90s, I would, in the beginning, say things like, well, we all know how inefficient the government is. And everybody would nod their heads in agreement. And I was going to political science classes or, or um, economics classes in the colleges, um, things like that. But towards the end of the 10 years that I did this, when I would say something like that, that the government was less efficient than the private sector, the teacher would argue with me. And there's been a cultural shift in what people know. And that's why, generally, when I went into the classroom, I always started with having the students vote on 
what their ideal system would be, and then what our government currently does. And this is a very effective thing for anybody who goes into the classroom. I'd put on the board, the minority should rule the majority, number one. The majority should rule the minority, number two. And three, everyone should rule themselves as long as they don't initiate physical force, fraud, or theft against others. So I ask the students to vote. If you got to decide how the world would work, the political world, what would you vote on? And about 90 to 95% of the students raise their hands for the non-aggression principle, the third item, which is the basis of libertarianism. And then I would ask them, how do you feel that the current U.S. government fits into one of these three categories? And almost no one would raise their hand for the third one, the libertarian one. They would be either saying the minority should rule the majority or the majority should rule the minority. So right away, you establish rapport because people naturally gravitate to the non-aggression principle. And then, of course, where you get all tripped up usually is explaining how that translates to the real world, yeah. that taxation is theft. That regulation actually has the opposite effect of it doesn't protect us. It actually turns us over to those who would exploit us. And of course, there's where that, but that's why it's important to get that agreement up front if you can. And if you're just talking to friends and family, it's just important, I think, to establish a similar rapport. So if they say, you know, if they're very negative, for example, and might say, well, in a libertarian world, people would starve in the streets. You know, you yep. need to be able to come back with something that will get them to ask you more. And so one of the things I like to do in that case, I, I, I like to say, well, of course, you know, we all want to live in a world where people don't starve in the streets, but the poor would have more in a libertarian society. And, and they go, what? No. <laughs> and, and so they say, how do you figure that? And then you have an opportunity to speak and, you know, maybe for five or 10 minutes because they want to know how that would work. You've got their interests peaked. And you also establish rapport with them by acknowledging the fact that you recognize that what they want is a better world. And of course, so do we. <laughs> so there's, there's things like that that can really help us when we're trying to share the message. Hey, everybody, I have a simple and painless way to get you out from under the thumb of big tech. Federated Computer offers a full replacement for Google, Microsoft Office 365, Slack, Zoom, and more for people who care about privacy and prefer not to be treated like cattle. Everything is encrypted end-to-end, -end, fully backed up daily, and we're talking about private email, file storage, team chat, WordPress hosting, CRM, help desk, email marketing tools, and more, all bundled into one easy, convenient monthly subscription. And you can add more users, unlimited users, without your price going up. You get great customer support, not from bots, but from actual human beings. These solutions are powered by open source software, so you can take your data wherever and whenever you like. Visit federated.computer slash woods today for your free 30-day trial. So how about that? A company that thinks its job is to do services for you and not instead act like your mother. Take your first step towards digital freedom. Visit federated.computer slash woods today for your free 30-day trial. You know, there's a professor now, I'm, I'm, I don't know offhand where he teaches now, but Robert Lawson, Bob Lawson, he's, he wrote a book with uh, Ben Powell at Texas Tech um, uh, called Socialism Sucks. And, it, and the subtitle was something like, uh, two economists drink their way through, like they, they went to various bars and pubs throughout Eastern Europe and former communist countries, and they, they wrote a book together on, on, um, uh, on, on that subject. And so anyway, but Bob on his own uh, had an article some years ago that I thought was very interesting. So he was looking at some of these, uh, some of these um, measurements of economic freedom in various countries. And what he found was that the countries that had the most economic freedom also had a poor population that suffered the fewest deprivations. Mm -hmm. So that you exactly. can see that there is a correlation uh, between these things. Now, in my case, well, the, the reason I was not 
initially drawn to libertarianism was that when I was in school, I just remember seeing uh, depictions in in my textbooks or or reading accounts from, let's say, the Industrial Revolution. And everybody's living at a very, very low standard of living and it, it see, and, and working very long hours for very little pay. And it seemed that that's what you get when you have a free market. Now, what I didn't realize, first of all, is that there, there's a lot of great historical scholarship on the Industrial Revolution uh, in the second half of the 20th century that's gone back and looked at that again and concluded that actually on balance, it was better than what people had before, which is the proper comparison. It's not a that's proper right. comparison to compare me in a high school class in 1990 with somebody living in 1790. It's, is the person in 1790 better off than he was in 1770? It's first thing. Um, but, but beyond that, uh, I, I realized that this was actually not the result of, quote, libertarianism. It's the result of living in a poor society with very little capital. You know, but but mm -hmm. nobody, no one put it that way to me. So I just thought, well, you know, obviously we need some kind of government involvement or everybody's going to be working in a mine at 10 cents an hour and all that. These, these, um, these stumbling blocks get put in your head pretty early. That's right. That's right. Our schools are really good at putting those stumbling blocks in, which is why when I described what happened to me over the 10 years I was in the classroom, um, what happened was there was a cultural shift because our teachers were getting a different type of foundation because they were in, even in the early years of their schooling, getting an entirely different message. They were getting the message that freedom doesn't work. It's not practical. And that's, that's why we do need to know the practical arguments of liberty. And that's, I think healing our world is still probably the most complete um, compendium, I guess you would say, on that. I think there were over, well, I stopped counting a thousand references uh, in healing our world because I don't want people to take my word for anything. Like, you know, I want them to go out and read it and decide for themselves because that's the only way you can really feel comfortable in uh, giving out a message such as libertarianism when you know that you're not in flow with the crowd. The only thing that protects you um, personally uh, when you go out and you get people throwing mud at you, so to speak, uh, figuratively or literally, the only thing that's going to protect you and, and keep you going is the feeling that you are giving truth out. And truth is pretty enlightening um, in, in a way. You know, I've, I've had libertarians come up to me and say things like, well, we'll never have a libertarian world. It's very discouraging. And, you know, it's kind of putting a, uh, a glitch in my life because I feel so bad about it. So I asked them, if you could go back and not learn about libertarianism, would you do it? No one has said that they wouldn't do it. And the reason that is that there's something about truth. You know, when you yeah. find a truth that you didn't know before, I think it elevates your consciousness. You know, you really, I know the first time I really put together what's in healing our world where I saw the, you know, the compassionate um, stance integrating with what a lot of our great religious leaders said and also with even atheists like Ayn Rand believed. It all came together and I mean, you couldn't wipe the smile off my face for about a week because it, it uplifts you. And that's why I think, although I don't think the people I ask about, would you go back and not learn about libertarianism? I don't think they were feeling like um, that they had had that moment or recalling that moment, but something in them told them that, that they were missing out if they didn't know how the world truly worked. Even if they looked out and saw that the world's not working like this. <laughs> So yeah, I've thought that I, too. Sometimes I've I've actually thought, um, not I wasn't really entertaining the idea, but I was just a, as a thought experiment. Uh, w would it be better never to have learned these truths, and then you could you could be blue pilled and just go through life not not filled with moral outrage twenty four hours a day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know that would be well, satisfying on some level, but 
<laughs> but but that yearning for knowledge and yearning for understanding, uh, I think I think overcomes that. So let's talk about. Tell me what your latest project is, because because you uh, you continue to stay active. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, for for twenty years, I did a column called "Ask Dr. Ruart." for the Advocates for Self-Government newsletter, where I basically gave short answers to the tough questions that that libertarians might be asked. Uh, I compiled that into a book, and now we've gone one step further at Liberty International. We have actually created a video course, which sits on Udemy, and we are inviting people to engage with it at a discount for the rest of the month. And it's really... Basically, like some of the things that we're talking about, but of course, integrated in a way that people can look step by step. So there are four modules. And the last module is one where I actually interview um, someone who has been, Bill Redpath, someone who's been really active in the Libertarian Party, has done a lot of ballot access. And of course, has been a candidate forever, just as I was. And that way, people can kind of see how these principles interact with libertarian candidates and, of course, just sitting around the dinner table and talking to your friends and family. And included in that is something I mentioned just a bit earlier, a free copy of not only my book, Short Answers to the Tough Questions in digital form, but also Healing Our World in digital form. And the reason is, is those two books kind of go together. And the way they do that is... The short answers course helps you create um, a way of addressing a person's fears or um, maybe even their uh, scorn (laughs) in such a way that you get into rapport with them. And then you give them kind of an unexpected answer that gets them very curious for more. And so they ask you for more because a lot of times people won't let you go on and on for any length of time. Um, when you try to explain liberty, because it isn't interesting at that point to them. But once you have an unexpected answer, uh, the one, of course, that's a big one in my world is about abortion. So what do libertarians think about abortion? Of course, you can you can answer that there are libertarians that are pro-life or ones that are just the opposite. But what I'd like to say is, you know, in a libertarian society, abortion would probably be obsolete. And then people go, really? How, how is that happening? So you get to talk more and get their interest up, and it becomes a lot different of a, much different of a conversation, I guess I could say. And the reason that these two books work together is because in order to give a delightfully unexpected answer when they start the conversation, you really have to know the details about the practical applications of liberty. And this gets back to what we talked about earlier is how in the U.S. we moved away from having a society based on liberty because we were told that it's not practical. But in Healing Our World, I go step by step through why it is practical. And I give those references so that the people who attend this course are armed with the intellectual ammunition they need as well as the techniques to establish rapport. Well, I've got a convenient link because I'm it, some of the like a Udemy link is too long. So I've got uh, tomwoods.com slash Mary will get you right on over there and you can uh, get all these goodies and and be taught by Mary. So just give me a, I don't know, name me three of the, of the I mean, we, you mentioned abortion, but what are uh, what are a few examples of the kind of things that we deal with all the time? And and you know what? Let's Let's skip the roads. How about that? Yeah, that's fine, but the roads are there too. Well, healthcare, of course, is my biggie because that's where um, I've done my professional work. And so, for example, when when people say, well, healthcare would be out of reach for most people in a libertarian society, I'd like to say in a libertarian society, healthcare would be affordable for almost everyone. And that 80% of our healthcare costs today are due to government regulations that harm us instead of help us. And I can say that because being in the industry, I found out a lot of what was going on, and I put that in my third book, Death by Regulation, how we were robbed of a golden age of health and how we can reclaim it. 
So if people want to know about why healthcare is so expensive, this is an excellent book to get started on. And it deals with my years in the pharmaceutical industry, 19 years, um, back in the time when there was some ethical stuff going on in the pharmaceutical industry, unlike many people notice today, is not the same thing. And basically what I show is that it was government regulations that actually pushed the cost up so much so that the only way the industry could survive was to capture the FDA, do a regulatory capture, which actually happens in a lot of fields, but most people are not aware of it. And that's why during the COVID crisis, we did not have an FDA that would evaluate things in a, what we would consider a truly scientific way. So that's another thing that people can look at. And again, I cover that a little bit in Healing Our World as well. So that's another big issue. And regulation, it's in general backfire. And again, in Healing Our World, I deal with that. So those are the kinds of things that you have to know. It, it does take some work to be able to engage um, with what people you know, want to hear about. And I also show how to engage with them when you truly don't know the answer and what you can do about it. So that hopefully is a way we can all progress in our understanding of what it means to be libertarian. Yeah, you should, when, when you're in that situation where, I mean, nobody can know everything. And somebody's That's raised right. an objection and you don't have the answer. Uh, you, you actually can, except on social media, in every other situation, you can get respect when you say, uh, you know what, I actually don't know the answer to that, but I'll try to find the answer and I'll, exactly. I'll get back to you. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, we can't be perfect. We And and that's one of the things I had to really come to terms with is, is that, um, you know, sometimes your answer isn't the best and you just have to go and learn more or you don't know the answer at all and you just have to admit it, you know? It's just got to be truthful. Yeah, no, that's right. But, but you know, the th thing is that it's, as I was trying to say earlier, it's very easy to be like a mainstream, uh, to have mainstream political views. Because if somebody says, where do you stand on regulation? You say, you know, regulation in the abstract, like no specifics given. Uh, the, the, the answer is generally, well, we obviously need some regulation, well, whatever it is, whether it's the economy or health or whatever. Well, you know, we need to have some regulation to keep people safe or to keep the economy stable or whatever. And no one's going to question you about that. No one's going to follow up because that sounds plausible to them. They've never, and mm -hmm. plus the word regulation has a soothing character to it. regulation to make regular you know so you know so that it won't be we think that regulation means things won't be chaotic that we can well, maybe we can in some way smooth out the dog eat dog aspects of capitalism through regulation mm -hmm. or you know i mean just given what most people think whether they've looked into it or not it's easy just to say yeah of course i favor regulation it's much much harder to say my instincts are always against regulation what? Why? Mm -hmm. Then you're in a position where you have to like respond to every regulation they could possibly think of. Yes, so it's way yes. harder to be a libertarian intellectually, well, yes. which I think in parentheses is one reason more people aren't. It's too much work. You know, I'd, I'd rather just give it people is. the one sentence answer and go on with my life. Ah, uh, but there's the payoff, you know, the payoff when you, when the light bulb goes off inside your head, when you go, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. And again, the personal payoff is that, again, I believe we really elevate our consciousness when we, when we um, find truth. And it doesn't matter where we find the truth. It could be in, in politics. It could be in humanitarian causes. It can be anywhere. And really, I do look at libertarianism as a humanitarian cause because it is what can make the poor wealthy. It's how we keep the environment clean. You know, it's it's how we discourage criminals and terrorism. So why why wouldn't we want to do that? And the only reason more people aren't engaged in that is the propaganda in the schools and in society have actually been quite intense in recent years. And this is what we're up against. It's it really really a challenge. And one time I asked myself, well, if I knew there wasn't going to ever be a libertarian world, would I still do what I'm doing? Uh, you know, it's similar to what you were going through when you were asking your question. And I realized that, 
even if it's not going to happen, which I don't believe at all. I believe it will because people have self-interest, right? So they want to be wealthy. They want to be healthy. They want to have a good life. So eventually, they've got a lot of incentive to wake up. They might not be excited about what they need to do to get there, but they're excited about the possibility that things could be better. That's what people are excited about. And that's, that's what I most enjoy sharing when I talk about liberty, because I'm sharing a way out of where we are now and a jump forward. And even if I don't live to see it, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of sharing that message. Because if we don't share the message, nothing will change. And, and we've been given a gift. I really feel we've been given a gift um, because we've got this, we've got this piece of truth that has elevated us in, not in stature, but inside of us. And it, it's hard not to share it. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Hey everybody, quick message on behalf of Monetary Metals. All Woods here has given his share of lectures on the importance of a sound money economy. But I also believe in personally owning some gold, giving me a little layer of protection against the crazy weirdo fiat economy I live under. Well, now you can take that one step further. It's one thing to own some gold. Great first step. But your next step is to open an account with Monetary Metals because with Monetary Metals, you can earn interest on that gold. Don't just let it sit there. Earn interest on it. You can earn up to 5% in their gold leasing program. And you can even earn double-digit returns in their gold bonds if you're an accredited investor. I put my money, that is to say my gold, where my mouth is. And a couple of years ago, I opened an account with Monetary Metals. And it operates exactly as advertised. It pays you gold on your gold. Well, it's time for you to do the same. Join me and our old friend Jeff Deist as we lead an honest money revolution that starts by opening an account at Monetary Metals. Learn more at monetary-metals.com slash woods. Well, let me, again, first of all, let me remind people, check out tomwoods.com slash Mary. Get all these great things from, from Mary. Uh, but I want to ask you something that, I think a lot of people who are not active in the Libertarian Party might want to know, which is which would be this: that um, now that you've said that you you believe that, that that it's almost inevitable that at some point, who knows how far in the future, we'll be victorious. Okay, it might mm -hmm. be harder to convince you with this line of argument, but but what a lot of people might say is, at some point, you have to realize that there are just so many diverse ways of looking at the world. And we are in a minority, and no, matter, and no matter how much we've pushed, we've only made so much progress. And so maybe we need to reconcile ourselves to the fact that we're not going to be in the majority, so let's at least struggle to get the most important things we believe in, and maybe the vehicle for doing that should be something other than the Libertarian Party, which for whatever ideological purity it has, has not had electoral success. At what point do you say... This just doesn't work. Uh, we should go into the Republican Party and get all the bad people out and try that approach. Well, actually, I think all approaches are legitimate. It's legitimate for people who feel that that's a good way to go. Go in there, get elected, and work from the inside. For those who want to teach the libertarian way, um, which is kind of where I come from. I'm basically a teacher. That's how I feel about my work. You know, I want to stay in the Libertarian Party sector. And if I run as a candidate, I have a platform to share the Libertarian message, the really good news about how things can be better. So that's important too. And, and a lot of people, they get into a single issue, um, maybe legalizing medical marijuana or marijuana itself. And that's their calling. And that's what each of us need to do. We have to find our calling within this, um, within this um, milieu of libertarianism. Now, a lot of libertarians that I started out with in the party left the party and started the huge network we now have of libertarian nonprofits. That's important too. And of course, I'm engaged in that as well. I'm chair of Liberty International, proudly so. And this is an excellent way to get the message out, not just in the U.S., but all over the world. 
one of the things that's occurred to me is if the U.S. loses its soul and, um, you know, basically gives up its freedom, I can very much envision a country in the developing world saying, hey, we are in really bad shape. We must, we must adopt a different system so we can be successful. And maybe that's happening in Argentina right now. Maybe so. I'm, I'm hopeful about that. I did a nice uh, episode on that subject. I, I want to ask you, um, again, I, I realize that people who aren't in the LP might not have a lot of interest in this, but you should because, you know, whether or not the LP has been super influential politically, it, there's a lot of interesting stories and it, it, uh, it illustrates the good and the bad of our movement at large in, in some ways. But uh, as since you've been in the party for a long time, can you maybe give us a, oh, I don't know, like a really brief pre-see of, of the ups and downs as you've seen it? I mean, the, I mean, because maybe you could say that there, there are identifiable groups within that group, that there are people who, uh, you know, more pragmatic people who think that the, the important thing is that we get elected and then we can make, try to make marginal changes, then larger changes here and there. And you have, um, you have people who are extremely ideologically pure. You have some people who are, um, you know, some people who lean right or left and, and kind of bring that into the party. Uh, and you have some people who are just part of the old guard. They've just been in the LP forever. And, and they're like their own group. How, do, how, how, should, how could a, uh, an outside observer, how should an outside observer understand the inner dynamics of the Libertarian Party? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, I do have some, some points I'd like to cover in that. So one of the things is the U.S. libertarian movement was largely found and based on people who read Ayn Rand, and I admire her a lot. She did a lot for the movement, but she did have one thing going on that I think was a big mistake that carried through the years that the early years of the party, and I think is still continuing today. She said, judge and be prepared to be judged. And the problem with judgment, as opposed to maybe discernment, is that it is a separating principle. In other words, if I were to judge you for the way <laughs> that you have chosen to spread the libertarian message, we would probably be at odds. You know, I'd be saying, well, Tom Woods doesn't do things the way I think they should be done. And of course, I'm right. <laughs> that's, that's the essence of judgment. Um, and of course, it would be hard for us to relate when we've got that level of separation. So one of the things we need to do, and, and this has torn the party apart many times, is recognize that there are many ways to liberty. And the way to do it is if you think this is the way we should go, then you go for it. So for me, the way that seems natural to me and important is teaching or communicating the message. Uh, so that's what I go after. And then, of course, you might have a very different view, or um, I know there are many libertarians that, that think that getting elected is important. I tend not to be in that group because, you know, w when I look at uh, Ron Paul's career, which is great, he did a lot of good whistleblowing on Congress, but he wasn't, you know, because he was one man or part of a small group, he wasn't really able to get effective legislation passed because of the way our system is. It's a majority takes all kind of position. So, you know, I've chosen the route that I want to go, but I don't judge him. I mean, he did something important. Like I said, we need all these contributions because different people will hear different things. They will relate to different people. So if we if we're so busy infighting, then we're not doing our job, essentially. We're not actually creating the world we want to see because we're, what we're preaching is separation. And if we need anything to make the libertarian world happen, it's we, this, this minority, which you pointed out that we are, we need to pull together and not not be tearing someone else down because you think that your path is superior, you know? Let them do what they want to do. The, the end result will tell <laughs> which way is best. I think all ways are good. 
you know, I think there's there's reasons to argue for all ways. And in my experience, I'm going into this in some detail because in my experience of the Libertarian Party, this is the single worst thing that we do. And we do it to ourselves. We tear each other up. It's it's and and getting back to this minority position, you know, people write about how civilization changes. And it doesn't take a majority. It takes a dedicated minority. The abolitionists, for example, they were not in the majority. But they changed the world. Well, on that note, I want to start wrapping up, but I can't help asking you one more LP thing, and then we'll, we'll make another pitch for your, uh, your, okay. your course uh, bundle. I don't know if you want to okay. comment on it or not, but I'm sure you've heard in the news that there's some rumblings about RFK Jr. being interested potentially mm -hmm. because it could give him ballot access in getting the, uh, the LP nomination. And you've heard, I've heard him say, you know, I'm fundamentally a libertarian. How do you feel about that? Well, I think one good thing about Robert Kennedy is I think he's trying to get to the truth. I think he's sincere with that. And if he, if he was, and, and I believe he is, um, I think if he came to some libertarian events, whether he tried to seek out the nomination or not, um, I think we might be able to convince him that he's more of a libertarian than he even thinks. But um, I do think that the Libertarian Party does have to be careful, too, about who they nominate for the presidential races because our presidential candidate is going to bring in people that are like him or her because that's, that's the way it happens. And I've seen presidential races where we had very little movement into the party and the people that did come in um, were, not, were not true libertarians and didn't want to become libertarians. And that's, that's a challenge to the party. You see, you want to, you want to grow. You want to bring in people and help them see a little further down the road to being a libertarian. But if you have a lot of people coming in that are really are not going to go down the road to be a libertarian, or if the party, which is currently the way it operates, does not have a structure to give them that education, then, then there can be big problems because we're a small enough party that we could be taken over. So there are pros and cons. I think the way to, I, I, would, I would love to have a conversation with Robert Kennedy. I would love to have a conversation with several people who are right on the cusp of becoming libertarian. <laughs> and it, all they need is um, for their particular issues to be addressed. And I think liberty addresses almost all issues. I would say all issues, but if I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the door open. <laughs> uh, you know, addresses all the issues that I've run into. It addresses them better than the current, other current philosophies of how the world should work and how, how government should work. Well, on that note, uh, let me, first of all, thank you for your time today and also remind people you can get all this great stuff and uh, including that classic uh, book by Mary, but, but more than just that, as you've heard, including her course uh, at tomwoods.com slash Mary. And might as well do it before this, I guess, this month of February is over. So you can get a little discount there. So tomwoods.com slash Mary. Uh, and once again, just uh, I'm glad you're still plugging away like me. And, you know, we'll, as, as you say, maybe we won't live to see the fruits of it, but that's no reason not to keep on doing it. So thanks so much, Mary. No, and thank you, Tom, for having me. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.